Welcome to the ITAM Review podcast. My name is Martin Thompson from the ITAM Review. Uh, this is a special podcast in that we are recording a podcast, but we're also recording recording a video. Uh, so we're going to try our best to describe both today. Um, but if you're feeling that you're missing out on some of the images, then please check out the screenshots and the video that comes with this podcast. Um, all will be explained in due course. Um, so today I have Jason Keogh from 1E. Jason is the editor for Dash 3 uh, of the ITAM standard and is also a long-term supporter and friend of the ITAM review. So welcome, Jason. Thank you, Martin. And you're going to take us through where we are with Dash 3 and um, I believe it's just, is it is it in the market or it's going through the editorial process, if I remember rightly? It was released in April of this year, so it's brand spanking new. You can see their first edition, April Fool's Day 2016, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got you've got a uh, a few slides to show us, and we'll we'll um, it'd be great to hear where we are with the standard. So so how is it being used at the moment? Yeah, thanks, Martin. So this standard has been under development for many many years, and uh, you know I'm delighted to say that it was finally released in April of this year. So. Um, it's fully released and, and some companies, certainly 1E, have been using it behind our products and other companies are beginning to, to leverage it as well. And we're seeing a lot of it now being requested um, in RFPs. People like Gardner have gotten very strongly behind it and suggest that it's of benefit. And I'll explain to, to people as we go through this why it's of benefit. And um, we're seeing it in about 60-70% of the RFPs that, that come in now that they're looking for um, ISO 19770-3 compliance. And that's what we're going to talk about, how it's going to change ITAM. Okay, and for those that are new to the standard, you have the the dash one, which uh, is the best practices. Dash two is the tags of putting tags when software is installed. And how does how does a dash three tag come about? So dash three is an encapsulation of what you're buying, as and when you uh, make a transaction on software that's either an external transaction where you're buying something from a vendor or it could even be an internal transaction where you're allocating software to, to a different business unit and what Dash 3 does is it allows you to actually encapsulate that complexity so what it looks at is you know your entitlements what is, you, what is it that you're buying the product the addition the quantity is that a bundle is there a limitation on the use what are your rights what contract does it relate to what is your license is there maintenance is this a perpetual or a subscription all of these details and as ISO we couldn't dictate to Microsoft or IBM or any other software vendor how they should sell or license their software so what we did was in order to provide clarity and, and, and understanding for end users when they're buying software um, we provided effectively containers and we said this is the descriptor that the, the containers that should you should hold that data so you put the name of the metric in here, you put the description of the metric in there, you put the quantity into this one, and so on. And that's what a dash three tag is. So um, how does that actually come about? So when you, for, for a dash two tag, you install some software and the presumably the XML tag gets installed on the desktop, say, to say, yes, I've got that, that software installed locally. How does it happen with the dash three tag? How do you actually get hold of it from the vendor? Is it part of their portal? Or are we not there yet? No, we're going there, yeah. So first of all, um, we want everyone to request that when they're buying software, the vendor provides them with an ISO 19770-3 tag, or an ENT tag for short, um, when they're buying the software. And there's very good reasons why they should do that, which I'll touch on in a second. But the vendors, some vendors are looking at adding it to their portal so that um, if you have a compliant tool, you can connect up to the portal um, suck the data out of it in Dash 3 format, store it in Dash 3 format in your local repository, and then away you go. But Dash 3, rather than having a file on every um, machine that doesn't work, obviously, from a licensing point of view, um, what it has is it, it allows for the creation of a centralized repository called an entitlement library. And that entitlement library is where those Dash 3 tags get consolidated. So, you know, any of the SAM tools can, can become an entitlement library um, and you know, there's, it, it envisages the requirement to have a tool because it's very, very complex to manage licenses. So, so let's take something like the Microsoft MLS or the, mm -hmm. how would that work in, so that, would that be in a Dash 3 format or would they provide that in a Dash 3 database? How does, how does that work? 
they would provide it in a batch free format. So literally you would connect up to um, the MLS portal, provide a username and password, and through an API it would download your um, your licensing position from Microsoft. Likewise, IBM's Passport Advantage do the same thing. And likewise, even your resellers could provide a Dash 3 compliant portal. So if you were looking at you know, Software One or, or any of the other resellers that have portals, um, they could provide out a list of what it is that you've bought from them in a Dash 3 compliant format. That would allow you to sync it down. Right. When you buy software, either through a reseller or directly from a vendor or whatever, if you ask them for a record in Dash 3, it means you're getting a consistent and, and ISO aligned sort of description. And that description is, is complex enough to cover any type of metric. So one of the key things about it being an ISO standard is that IBM people worked on it and Microsoft people worked on it, people from Symantec, people from some of the big four auditing firms, etc. Large and distributed group around the world. I'm just the editor of it, pulled it all together. So basically the uh, that means that Microsoft and IBM and, and several other vendors have satisfied themselves that the, the standard is, is sufficient to handle all of their edge case uh, metrics. So it literally can handle any metric from any vendor. And when you get a tag, that's the vendor or reseller's position as to what you've bought. If you import that into your tool, you don't have to type anything in manually, so it's much, much faster. And it's much more accurate. Presumably, it's um, it, it means less uh, consulting and wrangling of things, and more stuff can be done electronically. Or is that a, is that a pipe dream? No, it's not a pipe dream. It's absolutely correct. And it, the, the 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 human element should be minimised here. When when at the moment, if you um, buy some software from IBM or Oracle or whoever, and then you go to record that in your SAM system, you're probably typing in a SKU or picking something from a list to say this is what I've bought and this is how many. There are then assumptions being made either by you, the user, or by the SAM tool as to what that means in terms of your actual rights. Okay, So then your position is based on that set of assumptions going forward. What Dash 3 does is it eliminates a lot of those assumptions. It is an actual record that's agreed and, and was recorded at the time of purchase as to what was bought. And when you import that, it's accurate. Okay, and the vendor, when they come back in three years' time, you have less risk because the vendor can't say, well, that's not right. You know, what, what you thought you owned isn't actually what you owned. It, it's because the, the SAM tool that you were using, their library made a mistake because ultimately that's just the person's opinion. Or it's because the person who was entering it into your SAM tool entered it incorrectly. That isn't actually what, th those aren't the rights that apply. You didn't have that secondary use right and therefore you owe us another, you know, 100,000 licenses. Those risks go away because it's a. Uh, if there were mistakes made, they were actually made by the vendor. So the vendors so, need so, to be. Um, so let me ask you a concrete example of this, and, and and this this might be a um, this might be stretching the use of Dash Three, but um, SAP have sold a, um, a license historically, and then a new technology like mobile comes along, and people are accessing mm -hmm. the SAP database via a mobile device. So they didn't even know that they would need that in the future, but it is now a product use right because they're accessing the SAP database. So how would that, how would Dash 3 handle that in the future? How would it handle new technology that hasn't been invented yet and suddenly I need a product use rights for that? Because that's where people are being yeah, so, at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, so basically um, what would happen is that what Dash 3 is, is it's an encapsulation of your rights and entitlements at the time of the purchase, okay? now. Let's say a new version of the software, SAP or whoever, is, comes out, and that version allows you to now have free access if it's from a mobile device. That's a new right that SAP have applied. They can apply, they can supply you with a supplementary ent, which basically adds that right onto the original ent uh, within your library. So now your compliance system knows that it's allowed to do whatever, or that you know access from a mobile device is not counted as a, as a user access or whatever the, the rule might be. So it is up to the vendor to, um, you know, to provide you with those, with those tags. It's ultimately, again, we're, we're asking the vendors to inform their customers as to what it is that they've licensed, what are their rights, what are their entitlements. Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. And ultimately, as, as this slide shows, I mean, 
it's faster to import, you're not relying on anything manual, therefore it's more accurate. Therefore your risk is reduced, particularly when you're being audited post-fact, and your cost of running SAM operations and, as you said, some of the, the wrangling and, uh, and human effort is reduced. So it's really beneficial for people to do this, and that's why we want, whenever someone is buying software, we want them to ask the vendor to provide them with an ISO 19770-3 compliant record, an entity tag. And ultimately, when you're negotiating and buying software, you know, you're about to give them some money. So, um, you know, it's, it, you have some power at that point in time. So that's when you need to, to ask. And there's only two possible answers the vendor can give you. They can say yes, in which case it's great. You get that record, you reduce your speed, you know, or sorry, you reduce your time, you increase your accuracy, you reduce your risk. It's all to your benefit. They can also say no, and a lot of the vendors today will say no. But you're buying software from them, and it's very reasonable to ask that they give you a record. Effectively, an ent is like a receipt, and um, and and it's not just a financial receipt, which which you know your procurement systems aren't really capable of providing the data, as I'm sure you know, um, that you need to, to to encapsulate licensing. So when you're buying software, you need this additional you know what are my rights, what are my limitations, kind of data, which is what this gives you. It's a receipt of what you're actually buying. So um, if they say no, we're not going to give you that. It's a negotiation. Ask for something else. It's very reasonable to ask for that. If they say no, say, okay, well, I want a discount, or I want uh, you to provide me with a waiver from audit for the next three years, or I want whatever is relevant at that point in the negotiation. Asking for a dash three tag in every RFP that you ask for, and in every transaction that you're committing with a reseller and with a, with an end user, uh, sorry, with an end supplier or vendor, um, only gives advantage to the end user. It's something that you should all do. What I like about this is um, when we set up the campaign for clear licensing, uh, we didn't we purposely chose the word clear. It wasn't fair or simple. Yeah. Uh, and the, what this allows with Dash Three is actually you could get licensing that's actually much more complex, uh, but it, it, you've still got clarity um, because it's yeah. all it could be machine read licensing terms. Basically. The confusion has always been a key part of the problem around SAM and, and what the ISO standards in this case are trying to do. ISO standards at, at a core, any ISO standard, is there to develop a, a consistent vocabulary so understanding can blossom. And that's exactly what ISO 19770-3 does. It means that when people buy software, they understand it to the end level of detail. It is machine readable. As a matter of fact, there's a diagram here which shows the sort of uh, constructs that are within it. This is just a diagram of the XML. Sorry for the uh, podcast listeners, but it shows that you know you have an ent, which is the actual license itself, that relates to entities. There are people that are selling it, the people that are the vendors, people that are buying it and entitled to run it. Um, you have the quantity of a metric. It, it has test methods optionally. Um, so a test method is how you might test a metric. So you're allowed to have 100 users. You count the users by running select count star from users in the database. That's a test method. So a vendor can actually describe to an end user and to a SAM tool provider how to count the usage of this metric. Um, now, there are very few mandatory fields, um, but you know, the, 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 the quantity of what you're buying is basically the mandatory field. So it's very, very easy for a vendor to provide you with a compliant end tag. Uh, but if they want to go whole hog and give you things like test methods, they can as well. And that's, that's pretty cool. So it'll tell what, what versions it's valid for, what rights apply, any limitations on those rights, the contract and order information, all of that is encapsulated. And for those listening on the podcast, this is uh, we'll share the screenshot on the, uh, on the blog post that accompanies the podcast, but it's basically a tree structure of where all the data is stored. And I believe you also show a, um, you can show a, the actual XML code that goes behind that as well, Jason. Yeah, and it's a very simple XML. This is some of the basic stuff, but all it's saying to read through it is that there's a, an ent which has an ID, um, which is relating to an entity called Fabricam, who are a software creator and an ent creator, um, and an entity called Acme Corp, who are the entitled entity. So Acme Corp are buying something from Fabricam. It says they're buying a license for data intelligence, which is a product edition BI for 100 named user metrics, and it describes what a named user is. It says it's valid for version number 11. Anything, which is colloquially called version 2016, and then it says that the agreement number um, and the name of a doc that contains that agreement, so they can actually point at that on their local network if they want or whatever. And it has a one right in it, which is a perpetual use right, and it describes that right, and that's it. And this XML, which is obviously bloated because it's XML, 
fits on you know less than a page it was printed out and it's a very very simple thing for you know any any vendor to provide and it's very reasonable to ask them for it so with with um, that one of the cool sorry sorry, sorry Go ahead. but with dash 2 you can retrospectively create your own tags how does the dash 3 work in terms of you know you want you can't create license entitlement yourself can you well you can you can record it yourself so when you're um, these entities here fabric cam in this case are the software creator and the ent creator so it's saying that there it's the it's a, it's therefore it's a canonical ent okay it's it's like these guys wrote it and they're the end creator. This is the fact, okay? Definitive. So um, you can obviously use a tool to create a, a tag as well, like a Clarity R tool. And if you do, it would say that you were the end creator. So if you're working Acme Corp, it would say entitled entity and end creator. And therefore, we'd know that this is Acme Corp's picture or opinion as to what was bought, as opposed to this tag, which is Fabricam's opinion as to what was bought. And if we have a situation where Acme Corp have their own opinion, and then later they connect it up to a portal where Fabricam have uh, their opinion. We should be able to match them up and say, okay, well, this actually relates to the same quantity of the same product, effective from the same date. So it's actually the same thing, and we can say that, and we can then say that the as the Fabricam one or the vendors one is canonical. We're going to prefer the vendors one over our own one. And uh, and that way you you again benefit from the the risks. So that's where the vendor said no when they sold it to you. You you recorded it yourself, and then a year later they decided okay we'll get on this bandwagon and started providing dash three portals and they and they did so retrospectively. So that that'll still so, work. So on on that point, who is actively doing this at the moment? Who who do we need? So to... at the moment there are the, we've had a lot of support from Microsoft in in the ISO group as a whole. They were obviously the early supporters of Dash two. Um, they did a lot of testing on Dash three as it was being developed, and they they you know been uh, been working to ensure that they can encapsulate anything and everything which they they have. So now it's about actually getting that through the mechanics, and, and you know we're we're talking to them about that. Um, but Microsoft have been a strong supporter. IBM have been a very strong supporter as well. Again, a strong supporter of Dash two. Um, they both have portals, and and they're both very mature companies. Um, they're they're like they're they are two that I would expect to be early adopters. Other people were involved in the definition of it, like Semantic and so on. Uh, hopefully they come on board. But really, you know, we're looking to the, the vendors. It's not necessarily in their interests to to be this clear. Um, some of the vendors, you know, I don't know, I have to name the big red O, but uh, they they're famous for having that sort of level of obfuscation to some degree, and they won't necessarily welcome this. The customer has the power in this case. The only thing that can make this standard a success is the end users asking the vendors to provide them with this sort of detail, um, with this sort of record. And you know, when they do, it's fantastic. I mean, the next shot here is a shot from our product. And the reason it's there is to show just how rich the data is, just how much information you can encapsulate in a Dash 3 tag. Now, if you want to capture the, the full richness manually, you can obviously do so in a tool like this. Um, so you've got the contract data and the quantity and metrics and the product and the entitlement and the rights and limitations and your cost and order data and product details like the SKU and any audit and, and exclusions and so on, rights and limitations, all that good stuff. But to type it in manually is, you know, is a pain. You can actually see here from the standard, because this is aligned to the standard, the ones with the asterisks are the mandatory ones. So the entitlement type, um, the start date if it's a, a maintenance, um, the vendor product edition and version, and then the quantity and the metric. That's the only mandatory stuff. But uh, you know, it's it, you know, it, it's much easier if the vendor just provides it to you and you can import it. You can have something as complex as this just light up and work without any manual effort. And what, and, sort, of, uh, what, sort, of, what sort of wording should we be using with our RFPs in terms of Dash 3? What would you recommend? So I see, as I said, um, RFPs for, uh, obviously, for SAND tools, and they say things like, you know, must be compliant with, with, with ISO 19770-3, um, you know, tags and records or whatever. What I'd like to see people asking when they buy any piece of software um, from any vendor is that, that they want the vendor to provide an ISO 19770-3 compliant record um, when they when they do the transaction. It's literally just asking for a receipt. Yeah. Um, it shouldn't be too much to ask for. And as I said, if they say no, 
sorry, we can't do that. Say, okay, well, if you're not going to give me a receipt, then you need to give me a waiver from audit, or you need to give me a 10% discount because it's going to take me more time to manage your stuff than it would be otherwise, or, or whatever. But ask for it. It will only give you power. And when they say yes, um, you can import it into your sound tool, providing it supports the standard. And as I said, um, our tool supports the standard. I know there are other tools working towards it at the moment um, because they've asked me for details on, on how to do it as editor. And, uh, you know, you should ask your sound tool providers to support the standard. You should include it in your sound tool RFPs, but also any piece of software you buy, ask for it. Because even if your sound tool today doesn't um, doesn't actually isn't compatible with Dash 3, the chances are it will be in, you know, in future releases. So if your vendors start giving you Dash 3 compliant records, you can actually import them at a later date into whatever sound tool that you have. So um, I'm conscious of your time here, Jason, so I'm going to wrap things up shortly. Um, but uh, Steve Kloss with Tag Vault is the sort of body that represents uh, supporting vendors with um, Dash 2. Um, is, it, is he performing a similar role with Dash 3? Is there like a public record of, of where which vendors have got the tags and what's happening? Yeah, Tag Vault um, was actually set up to promote both Dash 2 and Dash 3 tags. And um, the reason it's synonymous with Dash 2 is that you know, Dash 3 didn't exist until this year. So, yeah, Tag Vault is the uh, organization that supports both, and Steve is the, um, is the director of Tag Vault, so he's definitely involved. Cool. Okay. And I think you were just showing a screenshot of some flashy um, looking graphs and whatnot on there. Um, yeah, so basically, once you've got us, the standard... Us, you can... sorry, sorry to interrupt. Tell, tell us why, in particular, you've got behind Dash 3. I'm interested why you've, why you've adopted it so... so um, wholeheartedly? Sure. I mean, well, first of all, we were developing a tool for, you know, managing licenses. So it was uh, the, the standard for that. So it made a lot of sense to use it, especially because I was the editor. But uh, once you're behind the tool, once you've got it, you can encapsulate so many things. And this is a BI dashboard sitting on top of the data that comes from Dash 3. But you can see you can model out your contract renewal dates by value, you know, when you're due to spend what. You can look at your entitlement breakdown by type, by vendor, by product, all of this kind of stuff. There's so much richness of the data. And um, you can actually drill into any of these and get far, far more data, you know, looking at the the, the, the sort of from, from the previous screen, how much data can be encapsulated. But it's just so powerful and that's why we got behind it. And you know, this this podcast and, and as editor of Dash Three, you know, uh, really what I want people to do is, is understand that it's a new standard, that it's a common framework for describing software license transactions. It literally is clarity. Um, includes information on the products that are licensed, the contract, the metrics, and it can eliminate data entry when it comes to recording licenses. Ultimately, leveraging the standard helps SAM you know, practitioners reduce their risk at time of audit, um, but the standard won't succeed unless the vendors and resellers provide the data in that format, and they will only do that if customers demand it. Um, so ask your vendors to supply you with Dash 3 end tags. And as I said, if they say no, you get negotiating power. And if they say yes, you increase your speed and accuracy and reduce your cost and risk. And I guess when you when you are asking them and they are creating Dash 3 standards, they need to think about what they're doing a bit more, don't they? They need to think about what they're actually licensing and give some bit more rigor to what they've done, what they've done perhaps historically. Well, I think they always have thought about it. Um, I think what this will... Uh, they have sort of enforced is that they can actually describe it and share it and right. they consistently. Haven't, they haven't necessarily communicated that to the customers as well as they might have done. Exactly. Like most, so, um, so, most polite way of putting it. And this ensures consistency. It isn't going to be some sales rep's opinion or interpretation of it. You know, with all the will in the world, people on the vendor side can obviously make mistakes as well. This will mean that there is a consistent understanding when you know when people buy things and if you negotiate special terms which obviously any large customer will often do that can very easily be encapsulated in a dash 3 in, entitlement as well so you know it'll it'll be a, a, a limitation or a modification to a right or an extra right or whatever it might be but that that thing that you negotiated gets encapsulated as well so that three years time or five years time when you get audited and that sales guy is no longer there you're not trying to scrabble back and look at email records because I knew the guy told me we would be allowed to do that. You actually have it encapsulated and it just de-risks things for the end users. So just one final quick question just to wrap things up, Jason. Um, I've, I've heard of things like blockchain of, of keeping a record of 
for example, if if I bought some software, I got a Dash three tag to prove my entitlement, but then I I uh, divested that company, and I went in to prove that I'd shift that Dash three tag over to another company legitimately with the with the vendor. Is things like blockchain a way to do that? Is are, are you aware of anyone doing anything around that? Um, so you don't need the, the the standard encapsulates what to do when uh, you're divesting, what to do when you're just even splitting something up internally. Um, so so you might want to um, you bought a thousand licenses, you break them into you know three equal groupings, and you send them off to different divisions, so each one gets three hundred and thirty three. Um, licenses and then you divest one of those divisions all of that can be tracked and is defined how that should be done is defined within the standard um, so you don't need to get into blockchain or anything like that okay. any tool that's compatible will will just work with it right Jason Keogh and it works within sorry just one last point it actually works within the um, within the functions of the software vendors I mean as I said people from within Microsoft and within IBM have validated that that they can support this. Whereas if you start doing the blockchain thing, it's very very technical, and, and will they be able to do it or not? And it, yeah. it becomes more difficult. The, the standard has already got an answer for it. Great, um, Jason Keogh, editor of the Dash Three Standard. Thank you very much for your time. Jason is sharing his details on screen, which is Jason Keogh K E O G H at one e dot com, or I'm sure you can find Jason Keogh on LinkedIn as well. Thank you very much for your time and uh, speak to you soon. Thanks, Mark. Bye.